Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support also helps us to continue to share this message of grace, peace, and Christ's righteousness in the finished work of the cross. You can give online at cokerministries.com or you can mail your support to or prayer requests to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parker's Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed. England won on the glory of filling a, a football stadium, all worshiping God at the same time. You know, that blows a lot of people away when they see it. They don't realize that what God is doing, you know, I'm going to say this nice, and it, it doesn't mean that it's less or not as important, but our world is pretty small here in Parker's. I didn't get any amens on that. Amen. I mean, is that reality to anybody? Yep. Now, and we like it that way. Say amen. amen. <laughs> Say <laughs> amen. That's why I moved here. <laughs> it's the last America <laughs> that I know. But, uh, but each, has, each has their place. I know it. It's just, you know, you stop and think about the 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 city that is worse than New York, the city that's worse than Amsterdam, you know, the city that uh, has more perversion in it than any other city in the world was the Church of Corinth. Okay, can I just say something quick? I guess not. <laughs> she is. Uh, here comes the Thessalonians teaching. Well, no, but okay, but since you said that, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. I, I really wasn't going to talk about that. But uh -huh. Curtis's mom had been looking up before she went to her uh, winter home in North Carolina. Um, do you know, she was looking up the largest churches in the world. And you know, oh. they're not in the United States. Oh, that doesn't surprise me. They're in Africa. <clears throat> and Numbers other places. Of people, maybe. And they are huge. They're what? You saw it. Okay. They were huge. They're huge. But what's even more sad that they're not the, here the largest is the largest religious buildings in the world, none of them were Christian. They were Hindu and all these other things. So we need to be about Father's business. And, okay, like the Thessalonica church. They only had a three-week revival. That was all they had. Three weeks, and they set their whole world on fire. Everybody knew. All of Macedonia had heard about the Thessalonian church. And they only had three weeks of instruction. And they didn't have all the Bibles and books that we have. All they had was Holy Spirit and The teachings other. of Paul. Yeah. Yes, and the teachings of Paul. So, Amen. we have no excuse. And so, you know, we didn't come here to start a church, but we, we believe that there's more to everybody's spiritual life than what they're experiencing. And we're, we've been about sharing the gospel in a way that uh, we've hoped that would give someone some idea, oh, there might be something else out there that I don't know that I need to know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's all our job is, is to give you an experience. You know, we've, we've had some people never seen, uh, Joyce taking a group of ladies to Wisconsin to a, to a retreat here coming up in October 28th, I think, something like that. And they've been there before and they move in the prophetic and lay hands on and uh, move in the spirit. So, um, and we've had meetings here that were. Yeah, we've had meetings now. here. Just to, you know, and, and <coughs> let you know that God's not in a box. Nope. There's more out there. And um, we talked about a scripture last week about uh, being ignorant 
And uh, some people want to stay that way. And I, I mentioned that sometimes it's some would be, sometimes I wish we, I was ignorant. <laughs> Didn't know what, because it seemed like the deeper you go. There's more to know. <sighs> there's more to know. And uh, I'd made a statement last week, and I'm going to correct it this week. Not that I made a statement about what I believe, but what I had heard taught before about something. And it's uh, once we d I dug into it more, I realized that that's not what this is. Remember, I said something. We were talking about the 430 years that the children of Israel were in the land of Canaan and in Egypt, in a land that wasn't their own, being sojourners and being afflicted and how there was some controversy when you look at scripture when the apostle Paul says that for 430 years before the law, the promise came. But yet in, in uh, Genesis, it says that they'd be in bondage and sojourners, or is it sojourners and in bondage and afflicted for 400, uh, uh, 400 years and there was some controversy there about how that how that, that can match up. And so we've dug into that, researched that, and we've got some facts and figures for you on that. We'll get into that later. Uh, and it's, it's quite impressive. But, but I just want you to understand that the whole purpose, we've been in the book of Daniel, the book of Isaiah, the book of Revelation. For a season now, we've been talking about eschatology. And... Uh, uh, by no means it was it ever exhaustive or meant to be exhaustive. It was just to tease you, to get you thinking, to get you thinking about Jesus coming back. Uh, there's a doctrine called the doctrine of imminency. Has everybody ever heard that before? Yeah. The, the, if you've been in Bible school, you've heard of the doctrine of imminency. It's the, the, that Jesus can come back at any time. And there's a doctrine based around that. And, uh, and, and really in your life and in people that you know, in human beings' life, let's put it that way, that kind of covers everybody, unless you're an alien. <laughs> there, there's two schools of thought that start everything in your life. You either believe that there was a, there was a divine creation, which means there has to be a divine creator, or... It's just a glob of mass, and it was developed by chance. Those two schools of thought right there will de determine how you look at your life. And whether you're in this group or this group, there's different branches of that. There are some people that believe, you know, there's all kinds of beliefs after that, but those two major divisions decide how you're going to see your life and what you're willing to accept in your life. There are people who believe that we're just a glob of, glob of mass out in space somewhere at some time and it just happened to come together and create life and, and uh, all the, I don't know how they can believe that, but they believe it, you know, and they have no room for a divine pattern because this is just a life of chance in case of raw, so raw, what will be, will be, and when they die, they die and that's it. Or in this hand over here, it's a plan of purpose. There's a plan, there's a purpose. There's a reason for everything. And when you begin to understand that you have a reason for being here, it begins to change the way you live and the change the way you, uh, the, you know, the way you live and how you affect other people in your life. And you realize that you're not alone, that you're, you're here for a purpose and a calling. Over here, you're living totally selfish and self-absorbed and over here, you're not. At least you're not supposed to be. And there's a group of thinking in both of those schools of thought that come together and they mix. And man, I tell you what, that's a double-minded man right there. The scripture says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And, uh, and what we need to understand is that there are, I'm going to try to share it. We're going to, I was worried, I'm worried that this is, the details of what we're going to share might miss the message. And, and in the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, and he's worried that that, uh, that that group of people be deceived like Eve was deceived. 
from the simplicity that is in Christ. And she was deceived in her mind. You know, she started thinking different than what God said. And, um, and it really is simple. There's so many simple things in Scripture. You know the story of Mary and Martha? You know that story? We don't need to read it, do we? Martha was a servant. Have you ever seen that story as a, a difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? Oh, see, there's stories like that that are in there. See, the Old Covenant was all about works and servanthood. Wow. And Jesus told Mary, oh, Martha was all worried about, you know, Mary because she wasn't doing nothing. She wasn't pulling her load. She wasn't being a servant. And Jesus told Mary, hey, there's one thing that is needful. That's to be in my presence, to recognize who I am. <coughs> See, that's the new covenant lifestyle. It's not a matter about all the stuff you do. It's about are you in the presence? The story of Mary and Martha is just not about, you know, which way are you going to live your Christian life? You know, are you, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a division between old covenant and new covenant. It's a different kind of lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. That's the message in it, but we miss it because we don't hear what the Spirit is saying. And I, I share that because there's so many people in the body of Christ that still don't understand the heart of the new covenant because they've been taught the servanthood message from the old covenant. So many people still believe that they're servants to God. No, you're his children and you serve the father's business you're about the father's business but you're not serving God to get you to love him you're serving God because he loves you this is what that whole scene right there Martha was distracted with much serving and see we missed the point there's so many people going to churches missing the point of Jesus's presence and I wonder what it means when there's 10 virgins and five are really excited and five didn't have enough. I really wonder what it means when the scripture says that God is looking for those that worship him in spirit and in truth. I really wonder what that means. And I'm asking this so you can ask the questions because you need to ask the questions. If he's coming back for those that are eagerly waiting for him, is what the scripture says. Are we eagerly waiting? People ask me, well, what if you're wrong? I'm going to jump on the next boat that comes along too. I'm going to eagerly wait for the coming of my bridegroom, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The difference it makes in your life, in your relationship, is unbeatable. When you're not anticipating, just stop it, wives. If you've ever, I mean, ladies, you've been married, men, you can put yourself in this category, but wives usually think more about it than guys do. <laughs> you know, we got one song. I'm getting married in the morning. <laughs> That's just when they started thinking about it. The wife started thinking about it before when she was eight, maybe four, the day she gets married. She's, and every day that gets closer, she's thinking more and more and getting more and more excited. And we need to be excited every day. I'm not concerned. And I believe it's going to happen quick. It's imminent. Nothing needs to take place. Nothing needs to take place. For him to return. Nothing. Well, it's imminent. And our heart is that you are excited about to say, man, I'm going to get a glorified body. I'm going to look good. No, I'm just kidding. I won't care how I look. But I'm never going to get sick. And the sin that beset me all my life, it won't beset me no more. Yeah, see? 
Yeah. I won't even be even be tempted. Mm -hmm. Oh, hallelujah. Just a reflection of glory from God. Yeah. We'll look like Him. And so, I, you know, amongst the details, amongst the, the, the stuff that could get us off track and forget the real message, think of Mary and Martha. You know, there's Old Testament scriptures. I was reading one today about, about uh, a father that, uh, well, it's Abraham. I wasn't going to get into details. Uh, wanted a, a bride for his son and sent out his servant to get the bride. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Yep. But a father wanted a bride for his son. And he sent the servant to go fetch the bride. Mm -hmm. Get her ready. Yeah. Holy Spirit in guess, me. Guess, guess what that's talking about? Holy Spirit yeah. in us. Getting a bride. Mm -hmm. Listen, listen. I, 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 before I get into some details about the, the Egyptians and all the, the stuff they went through. Listen, there's 300 prophetic scriptures that have been fulfilled to the very minute portion of scripture, or detail, all talking about the first coming of the Messiah. 300. Let me ask you a question. If you had a book where there were 300 Futuristic prophecies that were given some 1,000, 1,500 years before they took place. And they all came to pass. Would you read the rest of the book? And when you read the rest of the book, you'd find out that there were, for every one prophecy of his first coming and appearing, there's eight for every one about his second. There's over 2,500 prophetic scriptures based on his second appearing. And if all 300, not, there's not one that's not correct. I'd be thinking about his second appearing. How'd you put that? Did you just type that up? Yes. Oh, you're good. You'd make it look like I had notes. <laughs> you know, I, I would pay attention to the, the simpler things even. Even if you don't like those detailed things and all prophetic scriptures and all that. Just, just the Mary and Martha story is huge. Are you busy working? Or are you in the presence? Wow. Are we eagerly waiting? How about the story where Jesus even says that there was a, a great wedding and his son was getting married and the master sent out the, the servants to invite everybody, but these people didn't come. Give them a whole list of people to invite. They didn't come. Who said well? And then at the end of the story, he says, I'll go get the rest of the people. That's the Gentiles. That's us. And we showed up. I mean, there's so much in Scripture that gives us a picture that there's going to be a great celebration one day. Wedding supper and all. And I'm excited about it. I'm praying that I'll be counted worthy. And as long as I'm trusting what His Son has done for me and my righteousness is based on what He's given me and His robes of righteousness... That, I, that I've put on makes me worthy to be counted. And I'm going to be excited. I mean, I mean, that's just not, it's just not, not going to heaven gospel, people. There's more to it. Remember, the scripture says, put Romans, uh, I mean, Hebrews chapter 9, uh, 28. I don't know. Do I need to look it up? That's 928. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So Christ has offered once to, to bear the sins of many to those who what? Eagerly, Eagerly wait for him. He will appear a what? A second time. A second time. I know you've heard that. Oh, yeah. But hear, hear it from my heart. Don't get mixed up in the, 
the details, I mean, the details motivate me. They may not motivate you, okay? But they motivate me. Eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin, bringing salvation. For salvation. Salvation in its fullness is on its way. You think you've been, you, yes, you've been saved. You were saved. You're being saved right now by the washing of the water of the word in your soul. But there's going to be a, come a time when you have salvation in its, your fullness. Man, when you, when you even get into the, the Jewish culture, the Jewish wedding, the whole process of the Jewish wedding, uh, the communion that they take, the, the wine that, you know, the, 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 the bridegroom initiates the issue. The bride doesn't. The bridegroom and the husband, the, the bride's father and the, the bridegroom's father, they all make these arrangements and then they go to the bride. This is what we've planned for you. And this is what is yours. Do you want it? This is everything that, this is all. And the scripture says the goodness of God draws all men to repentance. When you realize everything that's been done for you, you then as the bride have the opportunity to say I do or I don't. Mm -hmm. And if you say I do, you take a cup of wine and you drink it. I and do. that is a seal. You're married from that point on. But you're not married yet. But you're married. You See, now you're married, but then you'll be married. So we're betrothed. It won't be consummated until he comes back and picks you up because he's preparing a place for you. With a shout yeah. and a trumpet. And that's the way it is in the Jewish culture. It's a year to two year period of time where he's building a house and they know that. And then when, he, when it comes time, the father says, go get your bride. He's all excited. There's a trumpet blast and the, the best men and all the, the, the grooms people go in and shout. And it's usually around midnight. Yep. And you got to be ready. Man, I tell you what, there, there's so many. And they go into hooping. And, and, and I don't want to get into all the, you know, we've tried not to get in. We've talked a little about all the different ways of thinking about eschatology with the all millennialists, the pre-trib rapturists, the post-trib, the mid-trib, the pre-wrath rathers. All this, hey, just be ready. Yeah. Just be excited. It will change the way you see the world. It'll change the way you see your family. It'll change the way you see other people. I'm just... It'll change the way you pray. Hallelujah. All right. That's enough of that, I guess. No. <laughs> There's so much in Scripture. I'm so eagerly waiting. Yeah. Hallelujah. Last week we, we began, we opened up a can of worms. It's really not a can of worms. There's a great misunderstanding uh, uh, about, uh, put Galatians chapter 4, verse 29. Galatians chapter 4, verse 29, and uh, I'll let you know what I said last week uh, when I get to that point and let you know that I didn't call the person and tell them that they were wrong. <laughs> I'm sure they've been told since then, but, but, uh, but as he who has been born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. See, that there was a, there was a persecution that was taking place. And so we need to understand when this persecution, does anybody know what this is talking about? But as he who was born according to the flesh, does anybody know that is, who that is? Ishmael. Say Ishmael. That's right, <coughs> Ishmael. He began to persecute him who was born according to the flesh. The spirit. Okay? And that's Isaac. And so we go back into the book of Genesis and find out when that took place. We find out that in the book of Genesis, uh, let me just turn here out. In the book of Genesis,
It says in verse... Chapter? Oh, I'm sorry. Um... Chapter 21, verse 8. Genesis 21, verse 8. So the child grew and was weaned. That's Isaac. The child grew and he was weaned. According to Jewish custom, they, and I, I know this sounds weird for some of us, we weaned our children at two years old. They weaned theirs at five. And at five years old, they were weaned. And Abraham gave a great banquet of meat. <laughs> I believe there was ribs and brisket. Anyway, we won't get there. So the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the what? The Egyptian. The Egyptian whom she had born to Abraham, what? Scoffing. This, now the word scoffing is what it was talking about in Galatians when it said the woman, the son of the flesh was persecuting. This was the beginning of the persecution of the offspring of Abraham. Did you get that? Abraham had offspring. Isaac and Ishmael were the two sons. And Ishmael began to persecute Isaac when Isaac was five years old. Okay? How old was Abraham when he was given the promise? Does anybody know what that is? Joy, put your hand down. Abraham was 75 years old when he was given the promise. Mm -hmm. You can read about this in Genesis chapter 12 uh, and other places like that. So we're not going to turn there unless you do you want to turn there and read it. But it says uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse four, he lived 25 years before he was 100 years old. In 100 years old, who did he father? Thank you, guess. Isaac. Isaac was birthed when Abraham was 100 years old. So 25 years went from the time of the promise given to Abram. And when he was, became Abraham, at 100 years old, he gave birth to Isaac. And Isaac was weaned at five. So when you add five to 25, how many years is that? 125. What? 125? Try 30. 30. Try 30. That's 30 oh, years. I, I said, oh, never mind. So, so what you have is a 30-year period of time. Wow, where Abraham was in a land not his own. He was a sojourner, but he wasn't persecuted. He wasn't afflicted. He wasn't a slave. Now look in Genesis. Look at Genesis chapter 15. We read this last week. Verse 13. Genesis 15, 13. Then he said to Abram, No, certainly. And this really, when you read this slow and look what's written, you'll make, make a lot more sense. And we talked about the Masoretic text last week. And uh, just to help you out, and you, well, we're not going to get into that. Uh, in about a thousand years, BC, uh, AD or 1100 somewhere in there the Masoretic text was finished and translations that you have or we have in the American Bible came from the Masoretic text and it had changed and taken out a few statements that's why people think the children of Israel were in bondage for 400 years but the math doesn't line up you can't have 400 years of bondage of the children of Israel to Egypt as slaves, and 430 years between Abraham and the law. It doesn't fit. Does everybody understand that? Well, okay, for those that weren't here last week, there's that verse well, in Galatians that says that. Uh, we, okay, let's read that one. In the book of Galatians, for those that, thank you, Joy, for those that weren't here last week or wasn't listening, last week we read the scripture. Verse 17 in chapter 
3 of Galatians. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later. What came? Let's read verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed was the promise made. There was a promise made to Abraham. And we've got the dates for that, the actual B.C. dates. Now to Abraham, his seed uh, were the promise made. He does not say unto the seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say that the law, that's the Mount Sinai event, which was 430 years later. So it gives you a time period. And I tried to get you last week to draw a line and put 430 years and put Abraham and put Mount Sinai. There's 430 years. Then how can you put 400 years from when Moses led the children of Israel, uh, when they were put into bondage, when Moses led them out of bondage? There's not room for 400 years in the timeline. And there's a problem. And the problem is it, through the Masoretic text and the phrase, and in the land of Canaan was taken out. Let me just read this back here in Genesis. It says this, Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, that he said to Abram, now certainly that your, here's a key. Can everybody see it? Then he said to Abram, no, certainly, that your descendants, not him. This is his descendants. It doesn't say him. Would be strangers in a land that is not theirs. And that comma is huge, even though there's not commas in original text, you have to understand it says this, that they will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will, be, will afflict them for 100 years. So the descendants of Abraham were sojourners and strangers in a land that wasn't theirs And part of that time, they would serve the other people and be afflicted by them. All right, now, if you want to take this down, you can take this down. We started talking with Abram. He was 75 years old. He received the promise. Abram was 100 years old when he gave, fathered Isaac. And Isaac uh, was five years old, that's when Ishmael began to persecute the offspring, the descendants of Abraham, but they were still in a land, they were always in a land that wasn't their own. Do you understand that? But they weren't always afflicted and they weren't always slaves. They weren't slaves until when? Until Joseph died and all the children died and everybody, Listen, there was a time when a new king came to Egypt that didn't know Joseph and the deeds that he had done. Does everybody understand that? The Bible says that, we, if you want to read it, we can turn to Exodus chapter 1. I believe we're going to start at verse 6, but we'll, we'll, we'll start at verse 6. Exodus chapter 1. And Joseph died. And all his brothers and all that generation but the children of Israel were faithful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mightily and the land was filled with them. Now they're in peace. They're living in Gosha. Uh, they're at peace with the, the, the Egyptians because everybody knew why Joseph had, how Joseph had saved their nation through the famine. They're all at peace at this time. So now you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and then you have Joseph. So you have all this lineage of people that had to live during this period of time. And I've got the dates if you want the dates, but we're not really don't want to, hopefully not get into that. 
Now there arose a new king over Egypt. You know the key word here is new? King. Who did not know Joseph. Now how in the world could a king come into Egypt, arise in Egypt that didn't know what Joseph did? Unless it's a foreign king from somewhere else. And so when you look back into Egyptian history, don't take my word for it. Go look it up. You'll find a period of time where Egypt was overthrown. I got to read the name of the people. This is what Egypt, in their chronicles, they call it the Hyksos. You can, I'll spell it for you, H-Y-K-S-O-S. It's called the Hyksos Invasion. And it happened in the latter part of 1600 B.C. in the first part of 1500 B.C. Only for a couple centuries, and Egypt took it back. It was during that period of time, go back to the verse, where it talks about, in, in, I'm sorry, the what verse? <laughs> Exodus chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, I do believe. Right? Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. That was this king that defeated Egypt. He didn't know the tribe. Yes, go ahead. What was the date you said that? 16, the latter 1600s and the first part of 1500s. B.C.? Yeah, yeah, B.C. I mean, I've got a timeline here that I... It, so you can just do it like this on a piece of paper. If you want to come up here and cheat and copy mine, you can. Okay. Huh? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. You know, I, you know, I found out that, that students nowadays... It freaked me out. I was, I was teaching at Christ for the Nations. This is a rabbit... Now, this is a true rabbit trip. I was teaching at Christ for the Nations. I was in the... <laughs> I, I, I was in the uh, uh, they had, at that time they had a third year class just for those that were uh, going further into their uh, yeah they were in, I was asked to come in and teach the last two, two weeks of the pastoral class the people that were going to be pastors and they had been sitting in this you know, getting doctrine, I mean, I should say it that way, yeah. getting inform informationalized about going into the ministry and being a pastor. And and, uh, and uh, I did say some things that kind of caught him off guard. Of course, the guy that invited me to do that knew that that was going to happen. That's why he asked me to come. And uh, I started off at just telling them how excited I was that they're, they had chosen the path of ministry and being a pastor. And I, I said... I said, well, if all you're going to do is uh, repeat, go into ministry, get a church, buy a building, get into debt, repeat what you've heard here, and that's it. I said, do yourself a favor. Go get a job. I said, the church doesn't need any more than that, of that. We need pastors out there, leaders that are willing to study and learn beyond what you've been taught at Bible school. Because there's so much. Bible school will give you a foundation. And even some of those foundations may be a little. Because everybody taught 400 years of, of slavery by the, because of a movie. Because of a scripture that's misunderstood. And that's why I said this stuff is. If you love the word of God. You're going to study these kinds of things. To find out what the word of God really says. And how it's really. We need to understand how we even got the Bible. How, how did we get this Word of God? But anyway, I forgot what I was going to tell you what I told those students in the... Uh, Something that they probably took a picture of. Oh, that's right. I was. We had all these slides and everything going up and all these facts and figures and we were teaching all this and they would get up out of their seat and because the big screen up there, they'd get up and they'd take their, their phone, I said the camera, and, and go sit down. <laughs> Man! Back in my day, we had to write it. We had to write those notes out. No, they took a picture of the notes I had, and that was it. I said, "What kind of?" St 
That's <laughs> cheating. <laughs> they didn't have to, you know, you, it's, something know, happens. I had to write and write and write. I had to write fast. Something happens in your head when you, that's why I, I make my timelines, because once I see it in a picture, I got it. And then they go back to their room and print it off. Yeah, and share it with their friends. <laughs> No, right. I've done that a few times. Get, yeah, get your crayolas out and make a good one. Color them suckers, you know. Get certain uh, lines that are, make so, it good. So you are saying take a picture of yours and then go home and draw your own. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, you can do no. That. Study. You can go get that rabbit over there. Yeah. Now. Just Google it. And it'll probably pop up. Yes. You'll, you'll find you'll find out when you do a timeline. You'll find out that Joseph was out there. <laughs> was that, that wasn't focused at all, Joy? Probably not. Was 110 years old. You know, th th there's a 64 year period of time. When you take this timeline, and you, if you want to, but when you take the a timeline, you'll find out that there's a 64 year period of time that is in question about what took place. That there's, well, you know, we know when. We, we know when Joseph died, and we know when Moses was born. And you'll find out that there's a 64-year period of time. And when you go into Egyptian history, you find that Hyksos invasion took place. And a king entered control of Egypt that didn't know Joseph. And he was scared that the Egyptians would join with the Israelites and overpower him. And so he defeated them and put the, Egyptians, put the Israelites into bondage. When that was over and the Egyptians took back, years had gone by, they kept the Israelites in slavery, kept them in slavery. And I'll just tell you this, there's 215 years that they were in the land of Canaan where they were not under servant to anyone. There was 215 years where they were under some type of servanthood. Some type, say some type. But they were only afflicted for a portion. Most people that understand this believe the most that they were afflicted as slaves was somewhere around 120 to 145 years. Still three, four generations. So, yeah. and, um, and you'll find out, I mean, when you do the math, find out that the Exodus happened in 1448 BC, and you find out when Abraham, does anybody understand when Abraham was born? 1948. Oh. You should remember that one. That's an easy one, right, Dan? Well, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> no, Abraham was born in 1948. What is known as AM. Anamundi. Hmm. There's a difference between 14, 1948 AM. The, the, I didn't want to get into this. We have BC and AD. And the new version is CB, you know, the common era stuff. But the Jewish people always looked at what they called Anamundi. They dated their dates from creation on. The first day of creation was that year one. The second day of creation was what? Year two. All the way through. Well, Abraham was born in 1948 AM. 1,948 years from creation. Hmm. Abraham was born and the promise was given to Abraham that what? He would be the father of a great nation. I'm saying it that way. When did, when did Israel become a nation? 1948 AD. AD. <clears throat> Isn't that something? Isn't God good? Always. That's just how precise he is. Yeah, just coincidence. Yeah, just coincidence. Yeah. Just happened. So it's those. See, see, if if you start digging beyond, so many people just go to church on Sunday, and and, and that's 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 uh, uh, fine. I, I, I just have to say this. <laughs> that's fine. You, you said it earlier, but I have to say this. So I mean, God has been extremely exact about everything. Everything. He, 
And he had mentioned before how Jesus very exactly fulfilled 300 prophecies that were given long before he ever came to the planet. And there are 2,500 plus yet to be fulfilled. Don't we assume, don't we, don't we, wouldn't we just then understand if God has been exact about all the others, he's going to be exact. Yeah, about he's going to be exact about everything else. And it's just amazing. You know, Not an allegory. Exactly. I mean, there's one of those prophecies that was fulfilled to the very day that the word said the children of Israel would be released from their 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 commitment for the sins that they had committed was the very day Israel became a nation. The very day, and it was 500 years prior to that. I mean, it's amazing. You know, the, the, the timing of the Lord and everything. So and, and as much as God wanted the children of Israel to know the day when the Messiah was coming, and they knew, I believe they knew, and they chose to perform the greatest apostasy that's ever been on the planet. They killed their Messiah. And most people at one time believed Jesus was the Messiah, but the leadership didn't receive it, didn't want it. Leadership kept the people from their future. And the whole reason for the, the tribulation period of time, the rap, and basically you need to understand the rapture is for the bride of Christ, the church. But the tribulation is for the repentance of the children of Israel. So they will repent and call upon their Messiah. And they will say, the scripture says, they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yeah. They will say that and he will be there because he will be their Messiah. They'll recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And if, if God wanted the children of Israel to know his first coming in as Messiah, and if eight times the number of verses or prophetic scriptures dealing with the first coming, eight times is the second coming, God wants people to know eight times my of his second coming. And people just fluff it off. The Bible is the most, the, the prophecy of the Messiah coming once and twice is the most, that is what this is all about. Yep. There's more scriptures about that than anything. Yep. But are we ready? Yes. <laughs> I am ready. Our, our, our goal in ministry is to prick people's hearts to start getting excited. If you're not excited about the second coming, you may not be ready. Oh, I got an amen in the back. Amen. Oops. Thank you. I made me feel good. If you're not excited about the rest of your salvation, Maybe you don't have any. That's just a maybe. I'm leaving that up to God. But remember, Jesus said that we many say, Lord, Lord. And Jesus would say, I never gnosked you. I never knew you. I never had an intimate relationship with you. You didn't know me and I didn't know you. You did a lot of work, but you weren't in my presence. Sounds like a Mary Martha situation to me, doesn't it? You need to read that story about Mary and Martha. Last week I had shared that I had been taught at one time that the person believed that the 30 year problem here between 400 and 430 was the 40 years that Moses left, killed the Egyptian, buried him and then he left for 40 years before he came back. And that never has made sense to me because that was 40 years and this is 430. And there was a 10 year problem. What? I even said that last week. Huh? Didn't make sense to me. Well, with what we've studied and seen, oh, now this makes more sense. How many years? Uh, Abraham or Abram, 25 years that he was before he gave birth, for, for he sat up before he conceived and uh, Isaac became it was was born and then five years after that he was weaned 25 and 5 is what 30 
And the scripture says that the descendants, the descendants, but also in the phrase there, and in the land of Canaan was taken out, not mentioned in the Masoretic text. But it says right here, the descendants. But see, he was also a stranger in a land that wasn't his. It wasn't their own, but they weren't afflicted. He went, they lived 215 years without being afflicted until they went into bondage, into Egypt. And they weren't even afflicted in Egypt for the first from Joseph till all the family died. They weren't afflicted. They were in glory. They had a whole section called Goshen. They lived in houses and they weren't in bondage in the houses. But then they were put in bondage. When the king came in, the Hyksos invasion took place. That right there answered most of all my questions, this Hyksos invasion. I even put a call into my, uh, my uh, master's in archaeology. See, I, I, do you know someone in, 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 that has a master's in archaeology? Raise your hand if you know somebody. Does everybody know my daughter? Raise your hand. She's got a master's in archaeology from the university in England. London, I should say. Got her master's there in archaeology. Well, which daughter? The oldest. Yeah, Christina. Christina. I put a call into her. She's smart. <laughs> like a rock. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to yes. encourage you. Yeah, yes, Dad, go ahead. If a foreign king took over Egypt, did the pharaoh name disappear? Don't, did it I come don't, back again? I don't know, but they, Egypt was able to retake their land okay. shortly after it was taken. And so there was a period of time when Egypt was not controlled. It, it, and when they took it back over... I have to go to my notes, excuse me. And they kept the Jews as slaves. Yes, it's called the New Kingdom period. And in Egyptian history, when you look at their history, there's a period of time where it's called the New Kingdom period. That's when they beat this, I think they were Syrians. Hmm. You know why? Because They're everywhere. <laughs> Syrians have always been the problem. The, the prince of the people to come, for the Antichrist, they're Syrian. Mm -hmm. Yep. You got, you got to remember the scripture says the prince of the people to come. We're talking about the Antichrist. Well, it was the Roman army, but which part of Rome? Remember, Rome was divided in two pieces: an eastern half and a western half. And Constantinople's not in the western half; it's in Turkey. Syria. And we, we talked about that. We talked about the five, remember the five legions? And most every one of those five legions was filled with Syrians. So they're not going to be Italians. They're not going to be European. They're going to be Syrian. They were Roman Syrian soldiers that when the scripture said the prince of the people to come and that's who destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. It was Syrian and Roman soldiers. Roman soldiers that came from Syria. Man. So I think this, and it doesn't say, at least I have not found, this is what Egypt called the group of people called the, the Hyksos. It doesn't say exactly who they were and where they were from. So if you find that out when you study that, well, we got some people in here that actually do take stuff and study. And uh, when you find that out, if you find that out, let me know. That way I'll be smarter. I didn't come up with all this myself. I cheat. I, I learn from other people that learn, okay? I take pictures of their notes. I knew you would say that. <laughs> you knew I was going there. Father, we thank you for this opportunity you give us to gather together in this year's place. Holy Spirit, you're the great teacher. Teach us how to be Mary's and not Martha's. May we cease from our work. Teach us how to work from your presence. May the work not take us from your presence, but may we work from your, your presence. 
May we realize that we're not trying to get somewhere. We're trying to go somewhere. We're coming from heaven to earth. Mm. May we understand that we're seated in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers, right now, in Christ. That we're at Calvary in Christ. We were in hell with Christ. And we were raised with Christ, if we believe. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support also helps us to continue to share this message of grace, peace, and Christ's righteousness in the finished work of the cross. You can give online at CokerMinistries.com or you can mail your support to or prayer requests to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the work. Be blessed. Be blessed.